what I advise advisors specifically is fly your freak flag. Let them know who you are. If you look at most advisors' websites, they are as bland and inoffensive as humanly possible, and they're utterly interchangeable. If anyone listening were to switch websites with a competitor, would anyone know? Welcome to the Active Advisor Podcast, brought to you by Harbor Capital. Join us as we learn from pros who have helped thousands of investors live better lives. I'm Brian Moore, and I'll be chatting with some of the brightest minds in the financial advisory business, bringing you insights on practice management and investment research that works for advisors and their clients. Joining me today on this episode of the Active Advisor Podcast is none other than Michael Levin, a New York Times bestselling author and the world's most experienced ghostwriter. Over his 30-year career, Michael has been responsible for writing, editing, planning, and publishing more than 1,000 books, with more than 100 of those books being for financial advisors and professionals. His client list includes advisors at several well-known firms, including Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, UBS, and LPL, to name just a few. Michael has also written for many top outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and many others. With his ghostwriting clients, including former Boeing and Ford CEO, Alan Mulally, and Baseball Hall of Famer, Dave Winfield. Currently, he runs AdvisorGhost.com and MichaelLevinWrites.com. In his free time, he offers an online course for the creation of business books at BestEarningAuthor.com. So without further ado, welcome, Michael, and thank you for joining us. Right, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I got to ask at some point in time where you get some free time in your life, but it seems like you spend a lot of time writing. Do you ever get a chance to read anything? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I'm a library rat, and I'm constantly reading because I want to know. I mean, I love learning. I love books. I love words. I love people. And I'm a heavy user at uh, my local library, and I'm constantly with my head in a book. So the short answer is absolutely. And it helps me a lot because when I'm working with an advisor or with a real estate professional or with anyone in a consultant, any one of the other verticals I serve, if I haven't written the key books in their field, I've read them. So I'm able to identify, hey, wait a minute, what did you just say? Nobody else is saying that in your industry. I've never heard that idea before. And you know, with all due respect to AI, which everybody's so either excited or terrified about, AI cannot do that. AI cannot say, oh, wow, no one said that before. Hold on. Tell me more about that. So the reading helps the writing. Absolutely. Very good point. We'll have to circle back to AI here in a little bit. Our opening question is typically, what is the first memory you have related to money or investing? It might be a little different from what you normally hear. Like every other kid, I was a huge sports fan. And uh, I remember reading a column when I was probably about 12 years old in the New York Times in the sports section. And they were interviewing a bookie. And they said, what do you do with the money you make? And he said, I'm buying Chrysler. It's $8 a share. (laughs) So I went to my folks and I said, I want to take my money and I want to put it in Chrysler. And they said, why? I said, well, I read in the New York Times that it's a good investment. (laughs) And we bought the shares. I don't remember how well it did or it didn't do, but that's my first association with investing in money. Taking a, When I told my parents it was in the New York Times, they're like, well, that's remarkable. It's got to be true, right? There's got to be some research behind it. Yeah. Otherwise, wouldn't we? No, it was a bookie in the sports section. Good with numbers, right? We're just going to go with that. It was good with numbers. He's a financial advisor in his own way. Yes. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. So staying the course with our trip down memory lane, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and what led you to where you currently find yourself in the industry today? Sure. I'm a lawyer by training. I went into law because I couldn't figure out how writers made a living. I knew all I ever wanted to do with my life was write, write books. And I couldn't figure that out. So I went to law school, figured lawyers wrote, judges wrote, three years of law school, and then two firms, five to six months each in those firms. Uh, all but fired from one, officially sat down and fired from the second. The news is not good. Go get your plant and your photos and get out, that kind of thing. And uh, I started offering private writing classes. That led to people saying, consult with me. And that led to people saying, just write it for me. So I literally backed into a ghostwriting career. And uh, that's kind of how it happened. And then along the way, some folks who were in financial services said, hey, we need books. And I came to realize quickly that they were by far my best vertical. And that uh, I've sort of had a specialty in folks in financial services, financial advisors, wealth managers, top insurance professionals for a few decades now. And as you said, I've done over 100 books for folks in financial services. Very impressive. And I'm sure you have a lot of great stories about that as well. I know in the intro, we named a few of your ghostwriting clients, which 
included some pretty notable names, if I do say so myself. Is there a story that comes to mind or stands out from your experience uh, ghostwriting for any of these high-profile clients? Well, sure. A literary agent I work with said, would you be interested in working with Dave Winfield? And again, big sports fan, I'd love to work with Dave Winfield. So he set us up and we went out to lunch and we had a nice time at lunch. And he gave me a, a sheaf of papers, about 100 pages, an idea for a book that he had. And I, he said, take a look and see if there's something here. So I looked at it when I got back to the office and I realized there was not a book here. This just wasn't going to work. And I came up with an idea for a different book. So we spoke two days later. I said, Dave, respectfully, I don't think this has a big enough audience and uh, some of your stature. And Dave Winfield, by the way, is a baseball Hall of Famer and the only athlete ever drafted by all three professional sports, NBA, NFL, and Major League Baseball for people who never heard of him. So I said, Dave, I've got this other idea, and here's the title, here's the subtitle, and here's the, here are the chapter titles. This is what it would be. And there's this long, long pause, long enough for me to say to myself, there goes the chance to write with Dave Winfield. And then the pause ends when he says, that's good. I like that. And so we did that book, and we did another one, and we've stayed friends. And uh, after the George Floyd thing during COVID, we would spend hours and hours on the phone talking about race. And uh, just to be able to share ideas and learn from him in that setting was just as powerful or more so than talking baseball with him when we did the book. That's definitely going to be a special bond and relationship that you two have. Not really, I didn't grow up a Yankees fan, but he was definitely a player that you admired on and off the field, always was a class act. Yeah, I'm not a Yankees fan either. So no disrespect intended to the Yankees fans in your audience. Barry, me, me wise, I mean, listen, you've got, you've got to respect the, the other but, film. Uh, yeah, I respect the, I taught my kids when they were tiny to say, we love the Red Sox, we respect the Yankees. Yes, very true. Very true. I just say they had a very good century. That's what I tell my Yankee fan friends when they say, do you know how many titles we have? I'll say, well, you have a very good century. Something that's near and dear to my heart is the art of storytelling. And there's definitely an art to it, which you've clearly mastered. Can you give us some insight as to why you believe the financial service professionals could benefit from having a book of their own? It's a great question. It all comes down to trust. And the essential dilemma that financial advisors face is how do you get people to trust you when they don't even know you? And you're not asking for trust on something small. It's their retirement. It's their legacy. It's everything. It's what they're going to pass on to their kids or grandkids, what their charitable legacy will be and how they will avoid as opposed to evading taxes. And all of it. It's a huge ask of a seemingly total stranger. Trust me. And so the question becomes, how do you overcome that? And the simple answer is that when they get to know your story, when they get to know you as a person, it's much more powerful than statistics. When I started writing, I was told no one remembers even a well-written government report. Even a well-written government report. Just, you know, people don't relate to facts and figures. They relate to people and they relate to story. And this is true ever since man sat around the campfire thousands of years ago at the end of the day of hunting. So it's when we tell stories, that's when we really, really connect with each other. And what I advise advisors specifically is fly your freak flag. Let them know who you are. If you look at most advisors' websites, they are as bland and inoffensive as humanly possible, and they're utterly interchangeable. If anyone listening were to switch websites with a competitor, would anyone know? Everybody's got the same stock photo of the six individuals of different races and ethnicities and genders, all nicely dressed, shaking hands and smiling across a glass table. I don't know what that means. The couple in their 70s bicycling on the beach at sunset. It's so bland. It's so interchangeable. And the internet turns all of us into commodities and commodities are judged primarily on price. So how do you get people to trust you when you're commoditizing yourself? And the answer is you let them know who you are, what you stand for, what you believe, why you believe it. It's because of the fact that you were in the military. It's because of the fact that this is the way you grew up. It's because of the fact that you're concerned about something going on in the world, whether it's politics or economics. And this is what you stand for. And when they know what you stand for, all of a sudden, uh, trust follows because they say, I admire and trust this person because of his religious persuasion, because of his or her political beliefs, economic beliefs. So story overcomes the trust gap. That's the simplest way to put it. And have you found in, in working with advisors that by telling their story, that not only do they 
individualize themselves, add a little bit more character around them, decommoditize themselves, but that they also increasingly have a better, higher propensity to attract the clients that they originally wanted to go after in the first place? Well, absolutely. It's a two-way street. You, as an advisor, want to work with people you're comfortable with, as opposed to you know, everybody under the sun who has a pulse and a net worth. And it's just easier when there's an affinity. When you say, this is who I am. I'll give you an example. I was actually closing a deal with an advisor who was hiring us to write a book. This goes back about 10 or 12 years. I was at a conference and we'd met there and we were signing the agreement on the spot. And I'm saying, this is the confidentiality clause. He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know there's a $20 trillion federal deficit? At the time it was 20, probably 40 now. I don't know. And I said, yeah, I'm well aware of that and confidential. And this clause means this. And he said, well, yeah, okay, that's a great clause. But did you know about the deficit? Whatever I said, I could have said, would you like a bagel or a toast? And he'd say, do you know about the deficit? So I got home and I looked at his website to see what he said on the website about the deficit. Not one word. Called him up. How come there's nothing on your website about the deficit? It's clearly the most important thing in your thinking based on our conversation. He said, are you kidding me? If I put stuff up there on the deficit, people would think I'm crazy. I'd be like, well, and I said to him, well, the people who feel the same way you do will think that, hallelujah, I finally found somebody whose investment strategies are going to be based on my core beliefs. And everybody else was never your market because they're going to look at you and go, this guy's a nut. He's obsessed with something that doesn't matter that much. As a result, we did a book that was 70% about the deficit and 30% about financial advising kind of stuff. And as a result, he cleans up in his market and he's talking all day long with people who feel the same way he does. And the good news is that they all know each other. People in niches tend to hang out with similar people with those same affinities, same interests. So he gets passed around and they're all like, you got to meet so-and-so because he gets it. And they all nod and say, oh, that's great. You finally found an advisor who gets it. That's why I say, fly your freak flag, stand out, get away from bland, get away from trying to be inoffensive. I don't mean go out and offend people. I just mean recognize that there's a core audience that you'll be happiest with and they will be happiest with you. So let them know who you are so they can say yes and it'll be happily ever after. So we use maybe that advisor as a kind of an example. I'm sure it's probably changed a little bit, but maybe not much. But how can a, an advisor leverage a book to differentiate themselves and attract the right clients? I guess it could be, or have you found that by publishing that book that it just started getting picked up by that niche group? Or was it something that they got talks about and kind of advertise a little bit? Or There are a lot of things you can do, and some of them are very, very cheap. The first is you put the book cover on your website front and center so that it is immediately visible whether people are viewing it on a laptop or on a phone. Because all of a sudden, they're clicking through. They're looking at X number of advisors. How many have a book? Don't bury your book. That's got to be, and your book with your smiling face on the cover, it needs to be front and center on your website. So that's the first thing people, oh, he's an author. She's an author. Oh. And then you bask in the glow of celebrity because even though people read fewer books today, they respect people who can actually make a book happen even more. So that's the first thing. The next thing is, you know, you can spend a ton of money on a marketing campaign for a book. My suggestion is take the book and write a nice cover letter to a hundred prospects that you identify in your area and tell them, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. And I thought you might enjoy this book because I know that you have the same concerns. Have somebody on your team, do some research and find a hundred people you'd love to serve Again, within a you know short drive of the office. Yes, you can have clients anywhere today, but people really do like it when they can just get in their car and go see you. That still counts for something, even in an age where we all, everybody thought the E-Trades would kill the entire financial services industry. They didn't. It's because people want to be with people. It doesn't cost much to put 100 copies of the book into 100 envelopes and 100 stamps. I mean, how often do you get a book from an author that's autographed and with a nice personalized note indicating that he or she has taken the time to do a little bit of homework on you and, and not in a creepy way, but just to find out that there's a connection there. That doesn't happen every day. And then you put on your on the signature of your email, a photo of the cover of the book and a link so that people can download the PDF version and they can read that. And then you can use the book to get speaking. And then the other great thing about a book is that it convinces the co-decision makers because a lot of the time, It'll be the husband in a couple, if I may be old fashioned, who meets the advisor for the first time. And then he goes back and tells the wife, hey, I found the guy. 
And if it's anything like my wife, she rolls her eyes and says, yeah, like the last guy you found for whatever, the plumber or the whatever. And then he says, yeah, but here's his book. And she reads the book and she says, you know, you found the guy. And this is true whether it's a wife or a husband or a partner or whatever. It's also true if there are co-decision makers involved who are lawyers, accountants, wealth managers, whatever it is. And so you're able to use your book to enroll the co-decision makers who were not in the room with you or on the Zoom call with you when you made the first prospect call. I could go on, but those are a bunch of ways right off the bat that cost practically nothing to get the book out there working for you. Given that a certain segment of the population is moving away from long-form content, what are some of the ways you can leverage a book to create short-form content? Most people today are doing short-form stuff. They're on social media, and I mean advisors as well as regular folks, everybody. And it's all about blog posts and everything else. So the mere fact that you have a book just indicates that you have more to say and that you're able to organize and marshal your thoughts in ways that are going to be really useful and important for the reader. This is an era where we're almost in a post-literate world, where people have basically given up on informing themselves. There are fewer newspapers and people are spending less time getting news from real and trustworthy sources. We're in a kind of a crisis that way. I'm not here to solve that crisis. I am here to help the advisor recognize that you want to stand out and that where everybody else is doing short form, you're going long and you're saying, I have a lot of thinking that goes into how I serve. And it's more than I can put in an Instagram post. And it's important enough that it deserves to be between two covers. And that's why I took the trouble to write this book. And the same effort that I put into thinking for the creation of this book is the effort that I'm going to put into serving you. And can the other advisors you're thinking about make the same claim? Probably not. So we've touched on some of the why, but now let's lean into more of the how. Several of our previous guests have been advisors who have gone independent and are trying to build their own brand with limited resources. What are some of the best ways to make a book happen with limited time and resources? I put up a course called the Best Earning Author System. And the reason is that there are a lot of courses out there that teach you how to write, but there's nothing out there that teaches you how to write a business book how to write a book that an advisor can use or person in really any area of business to use as a marketing tool, as the ultimate business card, as the ultimate leave behind. And it basically walks the person through how to organize, plan, have somebody interview you on, write, rewrite, publish, and best of all, market and monetize your book. So I could go on for a while, and I do. I go on for six hours and 20 minutes. So it, you know, it may be more of me than you really want. And I have to accept that. But the reality is that there's just a lot to know about how to do it the right way. And people make a lot of basic mistakes about getting a book done. First of all, they start and then they don't finish because they just don't have time. Books almost always fall victim to the tyranny of the urgent. So you've got to turn that phone call. You've got to close a deal. You've got to do something. You've got to get the filings in, you got to deal with compliance, whatever it is. So let me show you how to take the stress out. And I call it the best earning author system because best selling author status, you can buy it, you can pay for it. I've got a guy who can put you in the top 100 on Amazon for about $8,000. You can drop the price of your book for a day or two and have your whole list buy the book. And then you can achieve Amazon bestseller status for no money I know two people who can and do get books on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list for $65,000. So what I'm saying is bestseller status is often bought and paid for and is not a reflection of the success of the book. And most important, does not put money in your pocket. I'm big on what I call CPR, which stands for cash in your pocket right now. So if you want CPR, bestselling status is an important badge but being a best earning author, having a book that actually makes you money is really what matters. So I've taken everything I've known about this field in my decades of doing it, and it's really cutting edge in terms of the marketing and monetizing strategies. And it's all up there at besternauthor.com, which is where people can find the course. So if you don't want to spend the money on a ghost, I'd rather have you buy, well, of course I want you to buy my course. I'm being silly. But I'd rather have you get the knowledge rather than go to somebody who will claim to uh, do a book for the same amount of money that the course costs and leave you with nothing that you can be proud of or that you could put your name on. So you get what you pay for in ghostwriting as in anything else. 
Definitely, it sounds like. So let me ask you a question. I've also seen that you recommend independent publishing. Why is it better for financial services professionals to have independent publishing rather than getting a book deal with a major house? Sure. It's a great question. And my clients or my prospects ask me this all the time. The short of it is that most advisors who are not brand names will not get book deals no matter what for a number of reasons. The first is that you're busy building your business. They want you to have been very busy building out your social media, your keynotes, and your television appearances. And unless you have a major, major, major footprint in those three areas, they're not going to touch you. Second, they're not going to come near you because you are using your book to get business. You don't care if you sell a copy and all they care about is selling copies. There's a total mismatch of interests and they can smell that from a mile away. So they don't want you. Now, here's why you don't want them. And it used to be that everybody thought, oh, well, if it doesn't have Simon & Schuster on it or Random House, then no one will trust it. Today, people don't care. People don't even know. The, the major publishers have made a terrible error, an irreversible error, not making their brands part of buying decisions this, the same way card, cars or any other product. You, you know what a Kia is and you know what a Rolls Royce is, but nobody knows the difference between a Simon & Schuster book and a St. Martin's Press book. So nobody cares. So that's the short of it. Your market does not care who published the book. All they know is, all they care about is, does your book solve my problem? Then the question becomes, why don't you want New York, aside from them not wanting you? Well, it's going to take another year to a year and a half minimum to get your book out with New York. Next, you're going to control all the money if you publish independently. You can publish it for three bucks and sell it for 25 back of the room at conferences. Or you can give away all the copies you want. If your book has a uh, $25 list price on it, New York publishers will sell it to you for 40% off. So that's about 18 bucks. 60, whatever it is, you're paying $18 a copy instead of three just to have a copy to give away. So the math is not with you. Let's say that something happens in, in the world or in the market, in the marketplace that changes everything. And that happens seemingly every day these days. New York will not let you put out a second edition. If it's independently published, if you published it or a vendor that I like has published it, you can come out with a second edition a month from the publication of the first edition. I like to say that today, all books are either BC or AD. And that means they're either before COVID or after Donald. And it means that people can tell really quickly if a book is out of date. So New York is not going to let you update your book for years, if ever, whereas you can update it anytime you want. So in terms of time, money, control, cover design, all of it, independent publishing wins hands down for advisors. Excellent, excellent advice. Given that we're still in the first week of 2024, there's a lot of planning that needs to take place prior to publishing a book. What are the top three things an advisor should do this year if they plan on having their own book one day? Get going. That's one, two, and three. As I said earlier, books fall victim to the tyranny of the urgent. There's always something that you have to do. You don't have to have a book. There are tons of advisors who are incredibly successful, never thought about doing a book. But if you want to have one, get going. Because if you say, well, it's a Q2 thing or a Q3 thing, in my experience, successful, busy people only become busier as time goes on. They don't become less busy. They've got better opportunities. They're making more money. They're doing more exciting things, but they don't have more time. So it's not like you're suddenly going to have an amount of time that you don't have now to get a book done. And the next thing is hire a ghost, whether it's me or anybody else who's competent and experienced in this field because it's not the highest and best use of your time to get a book done. It would take a person weeks or months of locking himself or herself away to get a book done. I need an hour and a half to plan your book, and I need, or someone on my team needs, an hour per week to interview you. And in that hour, we can get enough for it, a full chapter for your book. Books that are successful range 125, 150 pages. You don't need to go longer. And that means that we need about 10 or 12 hours of interview time to get a book done. Everybody's got an hour a week for something important. The second thing is hire a ghost. And the third thing is when you hire the ghost or when you're talking to the ghostwriter you're going to use, ask them what they know about compliance and broker dealers and FINRA and those sorts of things. Because you can write a great book that will make make your compliance people, your broker dealer, angry as heck and miserable. And they're going to just be really unhappy with you going forward. Why? Because the book didn't follow the basic guidelines that compliance looks for in a book. 
I've been doing this for decades. I've watched how the industry has tightened up on advisors in terms of what they can say, what they cannot say, how they can say it. Every tweet has to go through. I mean, it's nuts. And meanwhile, the bad guys are still skating. So it's not like the system fixed everything. But the thing is that that advisors have to work in this system. So get going, get a ghost, and get a ghost who understands what it means to write a compliance-friendly book from the start. Those are my three suggestions. I've got to ask you, something I was thinking about since we first talked. You've probably had to do an extensive amount of research on the financial advisory and financial business as a whole, just to be able to write about these topics and kind of speak about them intelligently. Has it piqued your interest anymore in the financial markets, or are you still happy with the bookie Chrysler view of the world? (laughs) I think that the bookie touting Chrysler, he wasn't far wrong. (laughs) Pretty sure it went up. So I follow things very carefully. I have to because I can't have my advisor clients seeing me look surprised when they tell me something. But it's an absolutely fascinating world. It's an absolutely fascinating world. It is. It is. I didn't mean to diminish the bookie Chrysler, but I think it's just two different ways of looking at the world. Well, that's why I like to really read as much as I can and just get as many different perspectives. I mean, there are two great books about Elon Musk right now. One is the Walter Isaacson biography, and the other is the Ben Mesrick book, Breaking Twitter. You read them both and you see two different sides of Musk. I read them both. I love them both. You've got the new Michael Lewis book about... Uh, What's his name? Sam Banks something or other? The crazy. Big and Breeden. Yeah. And you read that and it's another Michael Lewis instant classic. It's really, really interesting. I was working on a book for an individual who uh, has a Bitcoin fund. And so I got to learn about that from the inside. It's an absolutely fascinating world. It never gets old or dull. And it's fun and it's money. So it's interesting. So I love this stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it sounds like you've been bit by the mug or bit by the bug, should I say? Yes, yes, definitely. That's great. Well, at Harvard, we're firm believers in active management, though it's important to acknowledge that everyone has their own unique perspective. From your experience, where have you observed advisors actively telling their story and making the most significant difference? Oh, man, that's a great question. I'll tell you a story about an advisor who did not become a client of mine. We met in my office when I was out in California back then, and somebody suggested to him that we meet because he needs a book. So we sat down and said, you know, what do you do? He said, I advise firefighters in the state of California within the last year of work prior to retirement about how to do retirement. I said, that sounds great. Have you ever thought about law enforcement or other public service figures? And he said, no, I don't need them. He said, they just pass me from firehouse to firehouse because they know who I am and they trust me. And I just go up and down the state of California. I go to the firehouse, wherever, when there's somebody who uh, was within a year of retirement and I get him or her straightened out and that's about it. I said, well, I guess you don't really need a book then. (laughs) He said, I don't know. So the short of it is, you know, your niche makes you rich and trying to be all things to all people is exhausting and futile. So it really comes down to Who do you like to serve the most? Can you take the time to identify your ideal client, your perfect client? And I have a picture, it's hard to see behind me. It's over my desk, it's of a lighthouse. And I thought instead of trying to be a flashlight scurrying around and trying to, you know, find prospects here and there, be a lighthouse, be a beacon for what you stand for, putting out a light that's a safe haven. And you'll attract the right people as long as you've taken the time to define who your perfect, your ideal clients are. So if you give the universe a mixed message, then uh, you'll get a mishmash back. But if you have clarity about what you're looking for, it's going to be 10 times or 100 times better than than, than it could have been. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Last question. Where can people find you? They can find me online at michaellevinwrites.com. It's my name plus W-R-I-T-E-S, like writesbooks.com. They can find the course at besterningauthor.com. They can find Advisor Ghost, which is advisorghost.com, which is just for people in financial services. And then finally, I'm going to give your folks my cell number. It is 617-543-3747. Even Yankee fans are welcome to call 617-543-3747. It's a Boston number. Operators are not standing by. It's my cell. This device, if you call, I will answer and we will talk. People say, why do you do that? And I once met a really top consultant who's Cell was cell numbers on his website. So why do you do that? He said, only the right people call. So if you think it makes sense for us to talk, then just pick up the phone and let's talk. So that's how they can find me. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And here at Harbor, we also love the Lighthouse motto. It is on our logo. (laughs) So 
uh, we share that same uh, affinity that you have. Yeah, precisely. And there it is. I see it right now. Brian, thank you so much. This is really a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to my favorite part of the segment, which is the lightning round, as I call it. But officially, it's called 60 Seconds with Michael Levin. Nickname? Shamsky. Hobby. Going to the gym and running marathons slowly. Profession if you weren't a ghostwriter. Typist. Piece of advice that applies to any client. Think of them and call them before they think of you and call you. What's your dog's name? Milo. How many marathons have you run? Over 20 and probably about 40-something marathons, half marathons, and triathlons. Favorite marathon location? Boston. What's the best professional advice you've ever received? Writers write and editors edit. It's two different jobs. Don't try to be your own editor. Best part of your job? Just this. I get to talk to really smart people. I get to watch really smart people think. And that's as exciting as going to the game and watching really great athletes perform. The next author you'd like to work with, or person you'd like to work with? I'm Brady. What is one topic or area that has not been written about in the financial industry that you would like to see written? I'd love to see a book that teaches young people not to be anti-business and anti-capitalist. Whether you're a seasoned advisor or just getting started, the Active Advisor brought to you by Harbor Capital offers professional insights for the financial advisor community. Visit us at harborcapital.com to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe to the Active Advisor on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date on investment trends, tried and tested research methods, and what your industry peers are up to. From all of us at Harbor Capital, thanks for tuning in. And now for important disclosures, This material is for informational purposes and is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast, research or investment advice and is not a recommendation, offer or solicitation to buy or sell any securities or adopt any investment strategy. The opinions expressed are as of 5th of January 2024 and are subject to change. The opinions expressed by the speakers do not necessarily represent the views of Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. The information and opinions contained in this material are derived from proprietary and non-proprietary sources deemed by Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. to be reliable and are not necessarily all-inclusive and are not guaranteed as to accuracy. This material may contain forward-looking information that is not purely historical in nature. Such information may include, among other things, projections and forecasts. There is no guarantee that any of these views will come to pass. This material may not be representative of the experience of other individuals. Reliance upon information in this material is at the sole discretion of the viewer. This material is not legal, tax or accounting advice. Please consult with a qualified professional for this type of advice. Investing involves risk including the risk of loss. Stock markets are volatile and equity values can decline significantly in response to adverse issuer, political, regulatory, market and economic conditions. Fixed income investments are affected by interest rate changes and the creditworthiness of issuers. As interest rates rise, the values of fixed income securities are likely to decrease. Specific companies and issuers are mentioned for educational purposes only and should not be deemed a recommendation to buy or sell any securities. Any companies mentioned do not necessarily represent current or future holdings of any investment products. Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. does and may seek to do business with companies covered in this podcast. As a result, listeners should be aware that the firm may have a conflict of interest that could affect the objectivity of this podcast. This material is prepared by Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. is not affiliated with Advisor Ghost INC. All trademarks or product names mentioned herein are the property of their respective owners. Copyright 2023 Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. All rights reserved.